welcome to our library. This is the Exeter Library, as you see. And uh, we are entering the reading room of the library, the first room. My name is Father Tony De Silva and I am presently the director of Xavier Center of Historical Research, uh, which is located in Porvari in Goa. Uh, this center was founded in 1978 with the sole purpose of doing research on the history of our country, the history of Goa, and the history of the church in India. The center in the course of these many years has developed an excellent library. It's basically a research library and it has got a very good collection of books on Indo-Portuguese history, also a collection of books on Jesuit history and uh, the history of Goa. And these collections that we have facilitate research particularly from, from scholars who are coming from different parts of the world and different parts of India. We also have a very rich collection of uh, archival materials like manuscripts and old books and so on, which are very helpful also to those researchers who want to use only primary sources. The most uh, uh, well-known collection that we have are called the Mamai papers donated to the Xavier Center by the Mamai family from Panjim in Goa. And those uh, papers are in a variety of languages. Uh, most of them are in Halle Kannada, so old Kannada, and quite a few are in Portuguese in English in, and in French. Now these papers, although they are basically trade papers, documents, they also give us a little idea of social history, who the traders were, what they traded in, how they traded with the local Goan traders, etc. So it gives us a very great idea of how Goa already in the 18th century was an international center for trade, very much like what we talk today about global India. So already Goa was global and uh, many traders from other parts of the world would come to old Goa and other harbors to trade. So these documents of the Mamai family are very precious to us, but unfortunately because they are mostly in old Canada, we have first to, so to speak, translate them so that other scholars, modern day scholars, are able to read them. That is also very important. And the last thing I want to say before we move on, uh, because these documents are so old, some are over 200 years old, they are beginning to fall apart and so we are now trying to get a project going whereby we can digit, digitalize these, uh, these documents and once they are digitalized we hope that we can make them more available to scholars across India and across the world. These paintings are of great value. These are of course reproductions. But this was done by missionaries in the 16th century when they would travel to a new country, like when they would come to India, then they would draw some pictures of what new things they see, particularly the vegetation, the trees, the animals. And once they would do it, they would send these pictures, these drawings back to Europe. And these then would be shared in Europe in small groups or at universities or in churches and so on so that people would become familiar with what 
is in India, how things look in India and so on. So that is why these are very valuable uh, pedagogical instruments and tools that these early missionaries used. This picture tells us a little bit about the boats that they used in order to cross the ocean. So they came all the way from the Atlantic Ocean, as you know from Portugal, and had to cross into the Indian Ocean, which would take place more or less in East Africa. And then they would come down all the way to Goa. So it was always a curiosity for people to know in what kinds of boats they traveled. And here we have uh, an explanation and a good drawing of how these boats were built and why they were so resistant to storms and to the various other uh, difficulties they encountered during the course of their long voyages. Typically a voyage from Lisbon to Goa would take six months. Sometimes they would stop over in Africa uh, uh, trying to uh, wait out the monsoons in India. And so therefore these were very long journeys and these boats had to be very strong and very resistant. Uh, these are the some of our periodical which are subscribing and they are very good journals. If you see that Indian Historical Review, South Asia, then we have a South magazine which is started by TSKK Mission today. So all these are the journals which we are subscribing day to day. This is our XHR series of publication. Now we have reached to the last series that is the 14th edition Public History of Goa. Okay. Beside this there are other publications also we have displayed here. Here I have displayed some of the rare things what we have in our library. Now if you take this is a Ultramar newspaper which only we have I think in our library. Central library they have but the collection is not so good. Then we have Mamai trade documents, they are in uh, four or five languages. These manuscripts, these uh, papers are in English, this are in French, Hali Kannada. Then we have here uh, in uh, Portuguese language. Okay. Then we have one of uh, the rare books by Jesuit and Pombal. Yeah. And this is the statistic uh, census of Goa, 19, uh, 1879. These are a collection of maps and diagrams which are really very uh, instructive and very beautiful. As you see, they come out of this great big atlas here. And so the information within this atlas is extremely rich. Obviously, I cannot go through the whole atlas, but I just want to demonstrate to you how these were utilized in the olden times and in the earlier centuries, how they would uh, draw these maps out in this fashion in great detail so that people 
could understand when they traveled, particularly when they came from the east. And so, for example, in this drawing, one can see if one is coming from the, from the west, the countries that we cross, and there is a little drawing here of Africa, for example, so that people, uh, the sailors and others who travel then could understand their journeys better. These also are more universal. They show not only small countries, but they show continents, the African continent, part of Asia, and so on. And these are done at a time when we would not imagine the detail that they could put together so that the people would really profit without being able to travel but just by looking at these maps and these descriptions. These are more technical uh, maps that sailors used and mariners used and these are of course to describe in great detail what lay on the coastline so all along the coastline so that they could follow a particular path in the sea when they were traveling as we must remember always the journeys from the Atlantic to the Indian Ocean as much as possible they would stay close to the coastline so that in case of any danger they could rather quickly come to the coast, come to the land. These are further maps indicating also the various currents in the seas so that mariners and people uh, navigating in these waters could understand where they were going and how they should navigate and how they should handle these waters. Portugal as a country became very famous naturally for putting out these kinds of sea maps because they were perhaps the greatest mariners in the 16th century. They crossed the oceans and they explored the world through the oceans. So naturally they were always in need of maps and that is why they have this very rich heritage. This is the coast of Africa, for example, it's a good example, how they have mapped literally the whole coastline with the names of little, little places all along the coast so that when the sailors would come, they would at least be familiar with where they were going and which cities, there were no really cities at that time, but which little, little places they passed by and thus they would know how they were faring on their voyage during their journey. This is again another map of a coastline that has been mapped right from the south, deep south, all the way right up to the north. And this is the coastline of Africa, Sierra Leone. There's another Africa coastline, very well mapped. We are now in our in the archival room of uh, Xavier Center. And in this room, we have got very precious manuscripts. And as we, as I had said earlier, when introducing Xavier Center, 
the manuscripts that are most precious and the largest amount are those from the Mamai family, the Mamai Kamath family from Panjim. They were a trading family and they did a lot of business with the Portuguese and with other Europeans who came to Goa. And as a result of the business, there was also a lot of correspondence back and forth. People would write to them and they would reply. They would act as what we call today clearing agents at the harbor of Goa. So being clearing agents, they obviously had lots of records. And they have given, gifted to the Goa, uh, to the Xavier Center here in Porvari, 200 years worth of manuscripts. Most of them are from the 18th century, 19th century, so two centuries. And therefore they are very rich in information about what was going on in Goa and about the history. I will just briefly uh, uh, explain to you the different types of Mamai manuscripts we have here for research. We have them in various languages. We have them, as you see, some are in Portuguese. Uh, quite a lot are in Portuguese, in fact. We also have them in other languages like French, uh, English, and uh, Marathi also and a whole big collection here of documents in Halle Kannada, that is Old Kannada, which is even today's modern day Kannada youth cannot read that. But uh, the uh, material, the information in there is very rich and uh, very enlightening to any social historian and also for trade historians and so on. I'll just show you a little bit so that you have some idea what a document would look. Now this document, for example, is uh, written in April 1789, this document right here. And uh, as uh, you might be able to see, it has got the Kamoti name. Kamoti is Kamat, and in Portuguese language it was called Kamoti. So he's writing a letter and explaining some agreement that is taking place in 1789. So more than 200 years old. The documents, some are very large because there are a lot of explanations given by the clients as to what they might want, etc. This is one set of documents. We also have other documents. Uh, also along the same lines, but this is more an accounting document as we see. They are asking for some products and this costs uh, the... the we are at the art gallery the Xavier Center of Historical Research. In this gallery, we display paintings by some Goan artists, as well as other artists who have delved into Indian Christian art. For example, here you see some of the paintings. These are of Mr. Angelo de Fonseca, a great contemporary Indian painter who's painted a lot of Christian art with a little touch of the Indianness, the Indianness that makes us connected, that makes us feel connected to these paintings. Here in the background, we have a painting by Sister Genevieve, whom Richard Taylor says, whom he considers as the only Indian Christian artist whom he takes seriously. Sister Genevieve, a religious nun, has painted this beautiful painting which is on the passion of Christ. It describes the full passion story right from the condemnation of Jesus right up to his crucifixion and then his burial. This is supposed to be Sister Genevieve's, one of her 
her best paintings and this is oil on plywood and sister if you see the painting very intricately you can see the intricate ways in which she has mixed colors so that you know it also stands out and the images are really brought to life that too with a touch of indianness in all the characters that you see in this particular painting right here we are standing next to a couple of angelo de fonseca's master classes you have here two panels that are oil on canvas we have christ that was painted in 1942 and we have madonna also painted in 1942 these are oil on canvas and these are so vivid that even after 70 years you can see the images how they speak to you they speak tons of what the painter was feeling was you know imagining at the time he painted these two paintings of his i'm happy to also uh, let you know that zevia center has other very precious documents that have been preserved for example i will show you these two portuguese newspapers that we have a collection of them we have a newspaper called a vida which is uh, from the 1930s onwards we have the collection uh, at the zevia center until the 60s and so do we have also a journal or a newspaper called diario da noite and that to date spike from the 1920s until the 60s so these two collections i'll just uh, uh, demonstrate to you how they have covered the world press and the world news in those days you may recall that in 1939 world war the world war began world war 2 and here you can see a big headline uh, guerra na europa so you can see this reportage that is very elaborate and also the quality of the newspaper is still very good so that researchers who come here to want to know how goa reacted to world war 2 what preparations were made how the portuguese government uh, prepared the people there is extensive reportage here of very high quality similarly we have got in this diario da noite which is an evening newspaper obviously it says noite which is night and in this evening newspaper there was also a lot of news and reports about the social events taking place in goa so that people were well informed and as an example in this issue of 1922 we have got here uh, on old goa about francis xavier and uh, the expositions and some historical information about francis xavier as an example so these kinds of uh, uh, research uh, resources that we have in the uh, xavier institute are very precious and we are working hard to preserve this so that other scholars can utilize them besides newspapers and the mamai papers that we showed you earlier we also have an array of more recent uh, gifts that have been given to us by families so we have the monsignor katao uh, documents with us and the monsignor katha documents mostly cover church history in goa also of very high quality and so we are looking now slowly to digitize them because more and more recent scholars would like to know how the church transformed itself after the liberation of goa because prior to the liberation of goa the church was very much associated with the state government of portugal that means of goa whereas after liberation obviously democracy came in and the indian government uh, operated differently naturally 
but we have documents of that nature with us. Also, we have got a collection of some liberation struggles that took place after the liberation of Goa. And so we have got papers relating to the trade unions and the struggles that workers had to go through, particularly those in the Marma Goa Harbour area. And because there were some uh, Jesuits involved in organizing them and so on. So we have those documents. And we have documents of Father Braz Falero, who, was, who worked with the Ramponkar struggle in Goa and on the coastline all the way up to Kerala. So Father Falero's documents also have been gifted to our center. We are now uh, studying them and we hope to be able to catalog them so that once they are catalogued and categorized, then scholars can utilize them to understand the liberation struggle of the Ramponkars as Goa fisher, fishing industry became more motorized and changed almost completely. So these are some precious things that we would like to also share with you, this kind of resources that we have in the center, which can be very useful to scholars as well as to other people who are interested. Our great problem we face is that all these documents have to be digitized in order to make them available to scholars. And as you know, perhaps digitization is a very expensive process. And so we are looking now to agencies for grants and for some help so that we can digitize these and improve our offerings to scholars from across the world. After I've explained to you all our resources, I would also like to share with you a little bit the vision that we have for this institute and how what the future looks like for Xavier Center. Now Xavier Center has existed for approximately 40 years and one of the great things we have done is built up this library which you have seen in this documentary uh, very well documented for, uh, for the viewers. But now we think we have to move uh, into this world of digitization of the library too. And so that is what we foresee for the next 10 years uh, that we would like to do that. We would also like perhaps to start an undergraduate program here on this campus whereby we can share the information that we have on history and we have a neighboring institute called the Konkani Kendra on the same campus. So the two institutes teaching the Konkani language and culture and we tracing and keeping track of Goa's history and culture. We can offer this to our young men and women in an undergraduate program. So a BA program in history and in Konkani and culture. Hopefully that will lead to an MA program eventually and eventually to a PhD program. This is part of our academic vision that we have. In addition, the other vision we have is to open up our doors to the local people, to the people of Goa, not necessarily only scholars, but others who are interested. And so we hope that we do conduct here what we call the History Hour. Once a month we have a public lecture that all people can attend. It is all are invited. And after the lecturer delivers his 30-minute uh, speech, then the people can interact with him or her, ask questions, share their ideas, and so on and so forth. So this is some of the ways we'd like to bring history and the culture of Goa to the people of Goa, particularly to the new Goans who are coming into Goa and who would like to know more about Goa. This is some of the vision that I can share with you at this time about the future of the Xavier Center. Thank you.